Benny. All right, Lucienz, are we ready? Yes. Right on. Uh, welcome everyone to the panel on accelerating ROI uh, from your digital investments. My name is Danny Digg and I'm your moderator for this session. Uh, I want to thank the IoT, IoT organizer for bringing us all together. And I woke up very excitedly this morning at around 5 a.m. And I wanted to call the organizer and say, hey, can we get an early start? Because they brought so many amazing people together in this session. And we have a wonderful panel. We have a wonderful audience. I want to acknowledge uh, Canvas uh, AI and their CEO, Humera Malik, who is, uh, who is uh, with us on the panel and for sponsoring this session. And I'm so grateful to you, our audience. We have an international audience this, uh, today. Uh, some people are already ahead of us uh, in, the, in the afternoon, in the evening, if, the, if you're coming from, from Europe or, or further east from, from Asia. Uh, please take a second to post in the chat uh, where in the world you are, you are joining us from. So before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available on demand um, right after the event and, and the organizer will send a follow-up email after the event. And uh, we are taking live questions in the second half. So please post those in the Q&A se uh, session, not in the, not in the chat, so in the Q&A section. Uh, and our track will run for 45 minutes um, we will have you out, out of here on time for the next session. So the organizer have like a really nice packed schedule for us with amazing presentations and, and, and discussions. Uh, and I just before we get started, what, it wouldn't be possible to have this virtual conference without our sponsors. Uh, we want to thank you, Alencia, Canvas, Eurotech, uh, Hitaki, uh, Hive, MQ, Fortinet, Lausanne, Trend Micro, Ursa Leo, Vertex, and uh, Wellware. Uh, so with the housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to introduce our topic is accelerate ROI from your digital investment. Like everyone um, likes to learn and to talk about success and we all want our organizations to succeed. We all want our communities to succeed. We all want the world to be a better world to succeed. We want our families to thrive. And the fact that you are here today in this session, it means that we share these values in common. So I want to introduce now the panelists and I want to thank them for being the thought leaders in our field, but it's more than that, you see. They are sharing so graciously with others what they are learning. They are not keeping it for themselves. They found success, but they're not keeping it for themselves. Like they are truly, they are a river, not a reservoir. So on the panel today, we have uh, Humera Malik, who is the CEO of Canvas AI. Uh, it's a software provider that empowers the world's largest industrial companies with actionable intelligence to make data-driven operational decisions. Humera is a dynamic leader with many international awards. Uh, next on the panel, we have Jonah Johnson. She's the CEO and the founder of Nemertes Research, uh, where she says the research direction and works with strategic clients, particularly around their IoT and cybersecurity initiatives. And we also have on the panel, uh, Marin Ambiar. Uh, he's a VP of product management, digital transformation at Emerson, and he leads the product management for Emerson's operational certainty solutions portfolio in the digital transformation business. And myself, I'm Danny Digg. I'm a computer science faculty at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm the founder and executive director for the Industry University Consortium on Advancing the State of uh, the Art and the State of the Practice for IoT. Our consortium is under the US National Science Foundation. We are working with several industry partners and universities. All right, so let's get on to the first question. So we are all here because we want to maximize ROI um, for our organization. We want our organization to be successful but how do we define success for industrial IoT? Um, and when I pose this question to the panelists, you could answer this from the vantage point of what you see inside of your own organization or maybe with your clients that you are helping uh, or maybe what you see in the community at large. So Humera, would you like to get us started, please? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, it's an interesting question because you get so many different answers to that question. Um, and everybody has their own perspective looking at their IoT side. Initially, when people were looking at it, they were just looking at um, going from a physical into a more virtual connective environment. So that's all it was being looked at for, is how do I go from physical connectivity into some sort of a virtual connectivity? But I think now the definition over the course of time has evolved. If you look at the, um, and I'll speak from an industrial perspective, if you look at the Industrial 4.0 initiative, it started back when in 2012, but where we are now is that definition has changed. It's not just about the virtual connectivity, but it's about being able to, to change the way we work today. Is how do we transform ourselves from the way we operate today 
from how do we connect with our operations, how do we manage our operations, and then how do we deliver to it? And that to me, the definition of this IoT side has completely changed beyond connectivity and it has gone into a full digital transformation where the, we're creating the future of the digital workforce, we're creating the future of the digital connected operations, and we're now relying on all that connectivity to drive these kind of operations for us. And one thing that has accelerated, let's not forget, the last one year, the pandemic has accelerated those initiatives for us. So in simple, I think those are the things is that it's really the, the IoT side has become about a full digital connected space. And, but it's also about the people is how, how, do, how are we augmenting the people with that connectivity? It's a combination of those three things in my view. Right on, thank you so much. It's about the, it's about empowering people. We talk about the, the, the IoT, but it's, it's, it, it, IoT is empowering the people behind. So, uh, Jonna, would you like to take, a, to take your, your, your uh, shot at this question on how do we find success? Sure, Danny. And I, while I agree with Humera that everyone has their own definition, here's ours. Uh, and just to clarify, since we are sharing the screen, Nemertes is a research firm, so we are constantly conducting independent, unsponsored primary research. This particular study looked at roughly 400 organizations. And what we did was ask people, we interviewed people as well as surveying, so we asked people up front, do you have an IoT initiative that you consider successful? Uh, and if they said yes, we asked them, what is the primary measure of success? Is it generating new revenue? Is it reducing costs or is it improving processes? And each, each person could only pick one. And then we said, what was your new revenue generated, re costs reduced and processes improved? Then what we did was select roughly the 70th to 80th percentile of folks and dub those groups the success group. And so what we found is that folks that are looking to generate new revenue from IoT were generating uh, roughly 100 million or more in new revenue if they were in the success group. Folks that wanted to reduce costs were looking at uh, much less significant, but still significant cost reductions on the order of 7 million. And those who were looking primarily for business process improvement were improving their process by 60% or more. So in sum, our definition is, is either new money, saved money, better processes, and here are the numbers that associate with those, those three metrics. Oh, thank you so much. And I love uh, having data and I love that, that you are doing this with hundreds of companies. So, so Mani, what, how, do you, how do you see success uh, from the point of view of your company? I'm, I'm going to connect to both, but what, the slide that Jonas showed, right? So the three different kind of uh, metrics. Um, we typically see customers are um, focused, when they focus on digital transformation, they're looking at areas of reliability, safety, uh, production optimization, emission energy management, sustainability, workforce and uh, empowerment. These are all three areas and it kind of fills in those three buckets that Jonah showed, right? So um, that's that's commonly what we see. And what we see is uh, starting with a goal in mind. It's probably the best way for digital transformation. Uh, the companies that succeed start with a clear goal in mind with a roadmap in mind, right? Um, if you, uh, an example here would be like a company we worked with in Singapore, um, a company called Denka, where they had energy challenges. They had uh, uh, challenges in maintaining their uh, uh, the steam consumptions. So what they did was they worked with one very specific goal, just energy focused, to save money there and to improve on uh, the energy. And they found the sensors, the deployment, the analytics, all end to end followed up later that was the, the solution to the problem that they had. So going with a problem in mind is really the big important step for digital transformation. Oh, I love I, I love how each one of you has, has, has brought stories and nuances. And I, I love money or perspective that you know, it's not like we have the hammer and we lo we're looking for the nail, but starting with the end in mind, that's what Stephen Covey uh, told us in the, in the <laughs> successful habits of, of highly successful people. So. I, I love that it's it's we are always looking at what's the problem and how can we make this a better world how can we make it a better organization how it's it's not what is the technology that we can apply here right on so a follow-up of this question is that um, and, and one of my mentors says in 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 life sometimes you win sometimes you 
learn. <laughs> okay. So what are the characteristics of successful versus the learning experiences, those less successful industrial IoT initiatives that you have observed organizations that you work with? I think uh, you just answered one of those yourself, Danny, by saying if you don't start with the end in mind. So we've been engaged with tons of these uh, industrials around the globe. And I can tell you that not everybody starts with that in mind. There is no end in mind. People, sometimes when they go in for looking for uh, going with that hammer approach, trying to solve a problem with that, that doesn't work. And sometimes they come out with those because they have actually done so many POCs. They would go out, they would say, I want to do an AI initiative without an end goal in mind is how do they want to apply AI? And because I come from that background, so I can tell you that tons of those companies have actually failed in those initiatives when they don't go with them, they're, they're, they're taking AI and then going around and finding a problem to solve with AI or any technology, they would take it that way without an end in mind. The other is a commitment. They're always in a firefighting mode. If you go into industrial site, everybody's in firefighting mode. So if you can't prioritize it, that's really where it also fails is because this is one of the other things that got added. So um, I think we will talk about sometime later today is how do we actually create an organization for success? But that really is, is, the, is the right way to go about it is you have to have alignment and you have to have collaboration between from the top to the people that are going to be actually implementing and using anything in a day-to-day -day basis from an IoT or digitization or digital transformation perspective. Um, those are the two that we have usually seen with no end in mind, no commitment to it. And, and the third is actually then not being able to measure what you're doing. Oh, yeah. If you can't measure, then you can't, you can't go back and show the ROI attached to it. We saw so, you know, that some numbers that we were looking at in terms of cost savings. I can tell you in some, lots of complex operations when we go in, people can't even isolate the benefit of it. So that's very important is whatever you're doing, you have to have the ability to measure it. Otherwise, this doesn't go anywhere. And that's where we have seen in those three areas is where we have not seen so much success with the digital transformation projects. Oh, I love that. Not, not chasing the shiny object, right? So, so looking at the important things and, and uh, commitment. And, and you know, many times people say, what, what you can't measure, you can't improve. And you can't show that you just like wishful thinking. I love that. Let's let's hear um, Amani. What what do you see as some of the learning lessons that you have seen the uh, the companies that you work with? I agree with Homera on those three points. Really well um, laid out. So those are typically the characteristics of uh, a successful or less successful uh, implementations. Just taking two examples, right? So one is the the current situation we're all in, and we all know how COVID vaccines have been created and and watch the race, timeline race that these life sciences companies went through to create these, applaud everyone's effort there. But when they went into this, a big deal is digital transformation that helped them significantly in this process. From the patient, when they're looking, looking at it, they're looking with a clear, clear mindset, with goal in mind, with a commitment uh, to get it, make it happen all the way from the top, and they wanna see it through. From the uh, production, from the raw material all the way up to the patient, right? So this is where we were able to partner and help these companies just use the same software that they do it in the lab. The same software then goes and gets deployed in the facilities in manufacturing, then applying um, analytics on top, modeling on top, digital twin on top, augmented reality or virtual realities on top. That enha enhances and empowers people going on more. In contrast, I want to touch on one of the points that Mera mentioned in the first question, which is the, the connectivity. That's the, the biggest challenge when, for customers who are not very successful is because when you're not committed, when you're not able to pull all the data from the underlying systems and sensors all the way up to the enterprise level, you're not gonna put the analytics to the best use. You're not gonna contextualize and use the data holistically. So those are some of the challenges we see when it comes to connectivity. To that end, we actually recommend four-step process uh, from, uh, for digital transformation. Start with a goal in mind, get the most out of the data, empower your people, multiply your success after that. Right, um, thank you for sharing. And Jonna? Uh, well, I love the idea of doing uh, sort of three key things, and we tend to focus on the very pragmatic. So I'll lead with, first of all, engage IT. 
Most IIoT organizations, 53% of them, are siloed organizations that do not report up into IT, and yet the successful organizations or companies with successful IoT initiatives are 16% more likely to have IT involved. So thing one, get OT and IT together early on. Thing two, uh, plan to invest, you know, showing that commitment that my other two colleagues talked about, plan to invest. Uh, successful initiatives, folks have spent an average, and this is low for IIoT, but the, it also included, includes proof of concept, spent an average of $2 million per initiative versus 500000 for less successful. So the good way to think about it is ignore the raw numbers and figure you got to spend four times more than you possibly might have thought you wanted to spend. And last but not least, make sure you're investing in the right technology. And when we went back and looked at our data, uh, edge computing is one of the top technologies. Folks in the success group were 50% more likely to be implementing edge comp computing. Networking, that connectivity and cybersecurity infrastructure, 172% more likely to be focusing on. And Humera will like this. Uh, cloud analytics is another key area. 42%, those in the success group were 42% more likely to be focusing on cloud analytics. So kind of to sum up, uh, make sure you've got the right people involved, IT plus OT. Make sure you've got a sufficient budget and make sure you're spending that budget on the right technologies, edge computing, network and cybersecurity infrastructure, and cloud analytics among them. Right on, right on. Uh, and I, I, I love how, how we are interconnecting and how we are confirming each other and how we are looking at from different vantage points. Um, so the next question that I want to discuss, um, it's been said that in life, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go with others. So for example, in this industry university consortium on IoT that I, I lead, we are um, thinking partners for many organizations. We believe that Together, you know, that's the part, that's the leverage, that's, the, that's, that's, that's how you maximize ROI, that together we can go further than anyone can go on our own. How do you view, each of you, how do you view the role of R&D partnerships, the, the role of collaboration uh, in maximizing R ROI? And I would love for Mani to be, be the first one to take this question. Thanks, uh, Danny. And, and, and we completely understand if we go by what we said so far, start with a goal in mind. When you have a goal in mind and you want to solve, the solution is not possibly coming from one vendor themselves. It's probably a combination of players that provide that solution to a customer. Therein lies this partnership. The first partnership starts between the customer and the, the, the digital transformation partner they work with. That's the, that has to be a really strong partnership. And then within the when it comes to solution providing, for us, for example, for Emerson, when, when Denka came with this requirement of like, hey, we want uh, analytics and we want uh, to understand our steam consumption and, and reduce the, the cost there, we had to partner with Microsoft. Partnering with Microsoft has really helped us significantly in terms of infrastructure as a service, software as a service, or platform as a service solutions that we have been able to offer. Other areas like cybersecurity, data management, uh, complementing solutions like augmented reality, virtual reality, or other condition monitoring techniques, 3D modeling. There are tons you could do there with data, right? So not everything is possible to be done by ourselves. So we 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 tend to partner with companies like the companies I mentioned, also the companies on your chart like Intel and Dell when it comes to servers, when it comes to processors. So those are uh, good examples. Uh, one example for augmented reality is when a customer, an offshore customer in Malaysia, remote a, uh, uh, location there, they asked for it. Emerson's global service, along with our partnerships with the augmented reality, was able to serve that customer immediately with a solution. Com combination of multiple partnerships, AWS, uh, Microsoft, uh, Emerson, and uh, augmented reality partnership. So partnership is key. Right, John. Jonah, what's your take on the partnerships? Well, first of all, I love the, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, but you want to go far, go with others. Uh, our data bears that out. We actually asked uh, our research study participants and clients uh, whether or not they had a strategic partner, and if so, what type of strategic partner. And what we found was there was an inverse correlation with success. In other words, successful groups were 78% less likely to say they had no strategic partner. So big takeaway is have a partner. The data tells you that that is going to make you successful. 
have multiple partners. We didn't drill into that, but I think the experiences of those on the panel is, is points that direction. The other thing that comes out of this is it does matter, roughly speaking, what category of partner you choose. Partners that correlated most strongly with success were in the management space, in the cybersecurity space, uh, and in networking, and interestingly, enterprise applications, because it turns out that a key piece of IoT is integrating into the environment you already have and the enterprise applications that are already there. Who best to help you with that but the application provider? Right, so Humera, what, what do you see from your vantage point? So Danny, the, I, I, the way we've actually distributed this is first is there is no co-op, there is no competition, it's cooperation. So it's all about working together in that ecosystem. So our learning from this is we have actually created a digital scale now. And a digital scale from one to 10, we map out the companies is where they land. Are they in the early phases? There are different definitions from the one to three. Are they from the three to six or are they beyond six? So early being you know, people that are still working on the connectivity side and they're just still getting themselves up and running with instrumentation. The middle part, people who have done some of it are looking to go beyond it. And then the other end is really is the people that are more advanced and they've actually gone out and implemented this and they're they're really far ahead on their digital transformation journey. So in that ecosystem, in that in that scale, then we've actually built an ecosystem now. So in about in about 40% of these customers that we deal with, they somehow get to fall in that early category. And that's where we have identified partners and we work with these partners in those ecosystems that get the customers beyond that. So they actually work with them. There is a timeline defined, they get them into the into the mid journey phase. And then, then we have partners that work with us in the mid journey phase to get the customers up and running. So we can get them up and running on their digital transformation so they can go beyond six. So now they're at seven, eight, nine, and 10, really. So that's how we've actually identified this ecosystem is we have built this ecosystem where it's enabling the customers. For us, the center of the universe, the nucleus, is really that industrial that's sitting in the middle and is looking to get started. They might not have all the answers. That's why this ecosystem is important. But nobody actually, even if they try to go fast enough in this, nobody will get anywhere unless they leverage the ecosystem. It's actually a point of strength. It's a point of leverage that we have found. And so we hugely rely on this ecosystem and hugely rely on where, but also on the right partner at the right time is just very, very important. Otherwise you would see this, uh, these uh, what they call as the POC purgatory, like they're just constant POCs that going on and on. It's because they don't have the right partners around them. It's very important to pick that right partner at the right stage. Oh, I love that. I, I, I'd I be taking lots of notes. So, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a professor, but I'm a forever student. I'm in continuous learning mode. So I, I love, that's why I love to be in a community with you. So, so let's talk about um, uh, people, the, the, the people, the empowering people we heard many times from the panel. So we are talking about the internet of things, but like any other great piece of technology, it is powered by people. So I want to uh, talk about the people behind the IoT digitalization and the digital transformation. So there are various teams that have different strengths and, and different agendas. And how do you get the operations teams to buy into the digital investment? How do you get the IT and the OT to come to and work together? How, 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 how do we help them cross this gap? Um, you know, which, you know, thinking about teams and people, which team should ideally be in charge of digital transformation? Is there a cross-functional team or should be members of a particular department or I would love to, to, to get your views on, on, on teams and who's responsible for what, for what. So Humera, could you get us started, please? Sure. Um, so this, this topic, we should have a whole other session on the whole workforce. <laughs> this, this is the one which is very close to my heart because I think that we are not doing enough to get this workforce augmented. So there are different numbers out there and I, and I, and I, I think Jonah can probably um, give us some stats related to that, but some of the numbers that we have seen in certain industries in the manufacturing and the energy side is about 30 to 40% of the workforce is an aging workforce in the next decade. And these are the people that can put their hand on a compressor and can tell you when this is going to fail. And so you have to be able to first identify is, you know, you have to be able to identify from a workforce perspective, what exactly are we trying to do? We're not replacing, we're not going out and replacing 
that 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 institutional knowledge what we're doing is augmenting the workforce so that they don't necessarily have to go out and put their hand on that compressor to know but they should be able to now we're in the set in this 21st century we should be able to identify that from the data that we have and the knowledge that we have of running these operations so from a workforce augmentation perspective i believe that the, the first is this myth about that everything, every technology is going to replace this workforce that has to, that, that we have to overcome that. And that has to be really tossed aside and say, what we're looking to do is institutionalize the knowledge base. We're looking, we're trying to cover this gap, which is going to come in the next, in the next decade or so with this aging workforce that is going to retire. So who would know how to put their hand in and find out when this is going to fail? And the third part of this augmentation is also the new workforce that's coming in. These are the people that work with these devices. They're the ones which is already a digital workforce. They're not going to go in and, and put their hand or, or test the temperature. They actually want tools and technologies that allow them to do that. I think one thing which really needs to accelerate besides this pandemic, which has acted as a catalyst, is the need of that workforce that's coming in now. No industrial would be able to attract this workforce if we don't if we don't go on this digital journey and transform ourselves. So um, there are so many elements of the workforce augmentation, but to me, the first thing is really how do we how do we get rid of this myth that's out there? The second is realizing and recognizing that there is a gap that's coming in, and the third is really creating the future workforce that's out there. But we need to get ready as industrials, as people that are responsible for getting these people ready. Is, we need to be able to create the right set of tools and technologies between digital transformation to be able to attract the future workforce. Oh, I love that. And my last thing I would say is humans are not meant for repeated functions. Those mundane functions, humans are not meant for this. And so that's really where we should also leverage technology because the next workforce is not going to come in and do that. Yeah, I, I love how you paint the picture that, you know, it's not that the robots and AI is going to come and, and replace people away, but it's, it's that we have to become the automators. We have like this, this new generation that wants to think about the digital force. We, we want to be the ones who are, who are going to be the automators. We are going to be the ones that, that there are new tasks, there are, um, th th there are new creative tasks that, that, that we can focus on and so I, I love that that um, a growth mindset and that it's like it's not like a fixed mindset, it's not a fixed mentality that, you know, th this is only the pie and if we, the more that we slice, the, the less what will be for the humans, but it's it's going to augment our, our workforce right on. Um, John and Mani, what, what's your view on the, on the people side of the equation? Well, I'll jump in. I have a couple of thoughts, um, mostly because I want to tie into something Humera said before it gets too distant. It's the notion of not replacing, but augmenting. And then Humera also tied in this idea of work from home. I want to tell you a quick anecdote. I was on a, a different panel talking about something entirely different, and I highlighted the fact that IoT is really, uh, well, work from home is going to undergo a dramatic change in the next couple of years where there are certain functions that people assume cannot be done from home that will be done from home, such as factory floor automation. And, you know, I was highlighting the fact that most of us are thinking in terms of the question of whether knowledge workers are going to come back into the office. And I'm like, guys, that's already decided. No, we're not, except for special purpose, you know, particular reasons. However, the real in interesting thing is that factory floor workers can be working from home using new technologies like cobots that do, you know, you talk about the person putting their hand on the compressor. Well, if you've got the right cobot, you put your hand in the gloves from your downstairs basement and you're touching the compressor a thousand miles away and you're picking up the vibrations and you can understand exactly what's happening with it. And when I finished with that, the people that I was on the panel with said, yeah, whatever, and went off. I was on, we were doing a prep call sort of like we did here. And the person who was doing the operations and logistics said, you are absolutely right. My husband has been running his manufacturing plant from our upstairs guest bedroom since COVID started. Right on. Ani? And uh, yeah, I think uh, augmenting workforce is a, is a great topic. And uh, that's that's where people, customers can understand like the technology is not going to replace, but to enhance what they're doing every day and uh, help them do better, right? So that's one thing. Uh, what what I also want to highlight in, in terms of like getting a buy-in, right? So that's the question around uh, how do I get buy-in from operations team or bring IT and OT together? 
uh, basically, once once one is to augment the workforce, the other thing is to make sure elevate this right. So understand the digital maturity of what the customer has. Um, going back to Jonah's point previously, where she said like IT and OT need to come together. Uh, they need to work together. Bring your IT in. So that's that's something we see every day when we talk to customers. Even though the project or the problem statement comes from operations, it's best to always bring IT into the picture so that there is a complete buy-in end-to-end. And then when you architect and deliver that solution, they're there to, to they're there as a partner, not as another department uh, in engaging in the digital transformation. That is very important that you establish that partnership between the two teams, IT and OT, so you can cross the gaps and you can augment uh, the workforce effectively in delivering those uh, digital transformation solutions. Right, John. I, I love that. So I want to I want to thread some of the questions that are coming uh, on the on the Q and A, and so so one is um, uh, the the notion of readiness. Everyone talks about uh, AI yet. Many industrial companies are slow to adopt. Uh, they are not ready. Why do you think is that? Can you can you speak a little bit about the readiness or what keeps them stuck? And being stuck sucks. Uh, but what what keeps organizations stuck and why are they are, are they not ready to move and to change and to to adapt. Uh, Humera, would you like to get us started on this? Sure. Um, one of the things is why organizations, when you start to separate that as part of a separate initiative and you don't think of it as your ongoing initiative. So if you think of any digital transformation, which is outside of what you do day to day, it becomes another task that gets added to what you're doing. So when we're thinking about, let's say on a plant floor, when we're thinking about continuous improvement, or we're thinking about reliability, or we're thinking about safety, all those things really need to tie back into what is your digital transformation strategy. It should not be separate initiatives, but it should all tie back into those. So I think, it's the, the organizational readiness just doesn't come from, you know, do you, have the, do you have the right data? Do you have the right people? It starts even beyond that is how do you look at digital transformation and how is it tying back into what you are doing day to day? So it's first is aligning that. Again, going back to, do you have an objective in mind? What are you trying to do? You're trying to get to continuous improvements. Well, how do we do it today? How, should, how do I see this happening tomorrow? What changes do I need to make in the organization? How does this tie back into my digital transformation strategy? So it really, you have to be able to answer, and nobody else can answer those questions, but these companies themselves. And then you start evaluating is, where can I start today? And how does that lead me into then transferring that knowledge and, and building that right strategy that allows me to then do that transfer learning across the organization? But when you think in silos, that's where things don't go right about this one is you have to be start to think is overall, but then how does your initiative, and it is constantly, this, this has to be in your day-to-day, -day, um, how you're thinking about your, your uh, function or for how you're thinking about your operation. Otherwise, if it's a separate initiative, nobody has time for that. Right, well, thank you. Uh, John and Mani, would, would one of you wanna take this next shot? Mani, why don't you go next? I jumped in last time. <laughs> Thanks, Jonah. Uh, the 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 whole idea is basically to to connect the, the teams together, identify a top level goal, whether it's right skilling, upskilling, uh, reskilling workforce, empowering workforce, delivering business transformation, or so. Identify the goal and and kind of make sure the whole organization is aware of what you're trying to do. Right? Uh, if it becomes a science experiment, uh, then it will leave a, it will live in the lab. It will never get to uh, full-on production. So if it is, if it's with a goal in mind and, and educate and empower your workforce to say, this is what we're aiming to do. And to Humera's point earlier, again, uh, measure the ROI eventually, right? So to, to say that, yes, I've tried to do this. Yes, we all work together. We got this done. So now let's go and do more. And that's, that's kind of thing that motivates people um, in, in terms of starting somewhere with a scalable approach realizing there is a success, measure the success, and then multiply them. Mm -hmm. I like that. Jonah? And sort of coming back to that question, what's stopping people from implementing AI? Um, I think one of the big things is a fundamental misunderstanding as to what AI can do for us. 
most people have the flawed, and including to a certain extent myself, and I'm a computer scientist and have been studying AI since the 80s, uh, we have a flawed understanding of what AI really is for. Most of us think AI is about getting better answers to our questions. AI is not. It's about better, getting better questions. Mm -hmm. And that's a really key point. So that AI can assist you in asking the questions that you ought to be asking rather than saying, oh, you know, I can get my answers to these questions faster, you know, and more efficiently and more accurately. It can do both. And so I think it's, it doesn't fit into our business process because our business process assumes it doesn't, it hasn't yet expanded the, the area that says, what are the questions that we would like to get answers to if we could, if the sky were the limit to the answers we could get, what questions should be, we be asking? So I think what AI demands from organizations that want to implement it is an openness to expanding that part of the business process to let the AI tell us what questions we should be looking at and have that built into it. If you look in science, you know, one of my uh, one of my side interests is in how the pro the practice of science is changing. Where scientists are actually deploying AI is very early in the scientific project process to figure out which paths to pursue which have the greatest likelihood of success. And that's really part of where AI really comes to bear in in IOT and generally in digital transformation. So I'd say that's probably the biggest reason that people aren't moving to AI is because they don't understand the value it can provide at the beginning of the process and aren't set up to have this iterative question asking, what questions should we be asking? Oh. Jonah made an excellent point, Denny. I'll actually add to that is one of the other things is I agree that people take it as a black box approach. And I don't think people out there are doing justice by still continuing to pitch it that way. But I also think one of the other things, in addition to what Jonah said, doesn't make it successful, is when people treat it as a black box and an outsourced service. Somebody else is going to come in, I'm going to throw my data at them, and they're going to solve my problem. While you've been running this operation for 40 years, how would somebody come in? How would a data science from outside come in and solve that problem for you? So it's how you go about applying it and, and, and institutionalize it within the organization. And that approach dictates either you're going to be successful or you're not going to be successful. So if you take that approach and treat it like a black box, throw my data over and somebody else is going to solve my problem for me, that's really where one of the other reasons, one of the, one of the biggest reasons where we have seen these projects not become successful. Oh, I, 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 I love the energy of how, how we are um, how we are getting inspired from each other. So maybe the last question that we can we can we can cover before we have to switch to the next session is um, I'm I'm going to Fred again interleave the questions that people are are so maybe merging a couple of them. So so it's this scenario that we get excited, we got our first proof of concept, the first success. Uh, after the first success, how do we convince the organization? How do we scale beyond the first success? How do we talk? Um, how do we talk with the with the with the leadership team? Uh, how do we talk with the customers, especially in some in some uh, industries? Maybe people are slower to, uh, you know, they, they they are slower to be convinced, or they want to they want to see more than just a proof of concept. So how do we move beyond our first success, and how do we talk, and how do we uh, engage in and get the buy-in from from the customers and um, from people inside of the organization and from the leadership team? So Mani, would you like to take to take the first shot at this? Yeah, uh, generally when you uh, have a roadmap in mind, when you start with a goal and a roadmap in mind, you probably already have plans to get there, where to get next, right? If for customers who do not um, have an idea and who would need help, like for example, uh, we have a digital maturity tool that helps customer understand where their maturity level is so they can they can plan with what they have, what they can do first, right? Um, to Humera's point, it's not about just throwing data, it's about the expertise and trying to see what we can get out of it. Like in Emerson's case, we have templated solutions uh, with, with analytics. So we can clearly tell you, these are the sensors you would mount on a machine like a compressor. Uh, you don't have to touch them anymore. You could have vibration sensors, you could have acoustic sensors. You can bring that data in. You can then use them for analytics and you can provide a, a clear failure mode effect analysis. Uh, uh, charts for customers to really get from start to end and, and and plan around that. So when you know that that kind of details to say like my goal is clear, I have a, a roadmap, I know who my partner is, 
these are gaps I have and I, I need to enhance that. Then what you do is once you have your POC done, a uh, 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 pilot done, then you go and use your standard stage gate process like you do with NPD, reflect on the good, bad improvement areas, right? So see what mistakes have been done, what's great that has been achieved, measure the ROI, and now you see how I can scale with, with this information and what I can do better from there. Right on. I feel like I'm energized. I'm ready to go <laughs> and talk with the Mr. C, C executive, or, or with 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 uh, with with the with the, with the C with the C level. Um, uh, Humera and and, and Jonah, uh, what's your take on this? Jonah, go ahead. Sure thing. Um, well, I think there's basically two things. One, I like to you know I like the observation of of talking to your customers, and I'll come back that to that in a second. The first thing is particularly the different groups who are involved need to carve out their roles and come prepared to present them to management. So in other words, one of the questions a lot of my clients have is, what is the role of IT, particularly central IT, when it comes to IIoT, which is typically driven by the divisions of the company? In other words, we have IT, but what do they have to do with the fact that we are building whatever it is that we're building? We're building widgets. That's a core business function for us. Where can IT help? The answer is, of course, in a lot of this infrastructure, networking, cybersecurity, uh, you know, potentially analytics. And so the idea is if you can agree ahead of time with the divisions where each side adds its own value, the divisions are the ones that understand manufacturing their particular product. They get that much more than IT ever will, but IT can understand the, the value of a common infrastructure, things like edge computing, cloud analytics, and the whole nine yards, and how to do that integration. Having that conversation so both parts of the group, uh, bo both parts of the team are ready to come linked arm in arm is going to go a long way towards, towards getting buy-in from executives. And you know the, the, the other piece of customers, I think it's a great exercise to reach out to your customers and find out what's going on in their digital initiatives and begin dialoguing peer to peer with them to really understand how you can look in because downstream, as, P as companies begin to implement things like digital twins, you're gonna be handing off a digital twin of your of your product to their group, which is then going to be running digital testing on that and quality assurance on that digital twin and kicking it back to you. So you might wanna know all of that ahead of time and get looped in early on. So that's really the two things, get self-organized among yourselves and then connect with your customers. Right on, so you are already advertising for the next session, which is starting in one minute. So we'll have Humera uh, uh, just, just, just land the airplane. So the next session is on AI and digital twins. And so Humera, how, how do we land the plane? Well, so I, I think that uh, both Jonah and Jonah and, and Manny answered that. I, I would just say, once you've actually done one, it's that's not the hard part you now to go back and convince others. It's the first one where the hard part is. Once you've done one and you can either show where you have actually either created cost savings initiative or you have actually you're, you're leading into better quality production or you're that leading into some better reliability implementations that you've done. That is an easier business case to go back to, to your management with. But starting with it, as we had said earlier, starting with it is really start with that end goal in mind and build a roadmap as Manny said, really. I think that's, that's really the key. If you're looking for successful rollout of digital transformations, always start with that end in mind have at least an idea of what business case do you have in mind that you're trying to prove. And then as Jonah had said earlier, then leverage technologies like AI and machine learning to prove those. What if I did this? What if, if I did that? Then what is the value that it generates for business? I think that's how you apply it and prove a business case. And then no executive or no management will say no to that. Right on. That's that's the right way to, to end the session. And Thank you so much. I've been learning so much, so much from you. It's so great to be in a community with you, uh, to be in a community with all the other people who are with us today uh, from internationally. And I'm looking forward to seeing the next session on AI and Digital Twins, which is just started. So um, uh, thank you, everyone. Much. Thank you, Dan. Together we go further. <laughs>